I have been sort of touched by this Bible lesson, and I want to share it with you, how the Lord has touched my heart on this and uh, throughout this week and even uh, weeks before that when I was thinking a lot about it. And this is concerning the veil that was rent when Jesus died on Calvary. And I want to talk to you about it and show you some things that I feel like that God has impressed me with. If you have your Bibles and would go with us on number one here, uh, this is when Jesus was on the cross and darkness was over his, let me get a little bit better focus there. And uh, Jesus was on the cross and uh, darkness was over all the earth for three hours. I'm going to read the verses of scripture here to you. And uh, when Jesus died on Calvary, uh, darkness came over the earth for three hours. Look at verse 45 of, of Matthew 27. Now this is recorded in, also in uh, Mark. It's also recorded in Luke. <clears throat> but I've chosen Matthew here. <clears throat> they all say about the same thing. 45 says now from the sixth hour. The sixth hour is from 11, is from uh, the 11 to 12 noon. Now the hours go from like about six o'clock, about six to seven, 78, eight to nine, nine, 10, so forth, right on down. And the sixth hour would be about from 11 o'clock a.m. to noontime. So from about uh, 11 o'clock or 12, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. The ninth hour would be between 2 and 3 p.m. Uh, the Jewish time system, the hours were from about 6 on down to about 6 p.m. And then the watches were at night. Three hours would make up a watch. They had four watches through the night. I won't get into detail on that. That's immaterial. But I just want to let you know here what this is referring to here when it talks about uh, these hours. Uh, John whose gospel book was written after Matthew, Mark, and Luke's were written and after the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed in Jerusalem in 70 AD, his gospel was written in 90 AD, 20 years later. The, the, the clock system of the Jews, nobody followed it anymore. They followed what was done by the Romans. And so the Romans had theirs like we have ours today. Same thing, starting at midnight, the first hour was from 12, from 12 to 1. The second hour was from 1 to 2. And you know the story, it goes right on through like that. So that by daybreak, you're at 6 o'clock, where with the Jews, they were just starting out with their hours, the first hour, second hour. You understand what I'm saying? So when you read John, and he talks about darkness being over the earth, and he talks about Jesus being on the cross, his hours are different. And I've had people say, oh, you see, there's a contradiction in the scriptures. No, there wasn't. No contradiction, except the only difference there is that John's following the Roman time system and Matthew, Mark, and Luke was following the Jewish time system. Everybody understand what I'm saying here? All right. I'm going to move on here because this is what happened when Jesus was on the cross and uh, darkness came over all the earth from that period of time. Verse 46 and about the ninth hour, this is about the end of that period of time, about the three o'clock, somewhere between two and three o'clock in the afternoon. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this was Jesus whenever he was giving up, going fixing to die on the cross. And he cried out in that fashion, because he died the death of taking your sins and my sins upon himself. In other words, he did not die to feel like he was entering into glory. He died as though he took all of our sins upon himself. And he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he said it in pure Hebrew, pure Hebrew, not Aramaic. In the New Testament, they spoke Aramaic, which was a conglomeration of, uh, of Hebrew um, it was a uh, Arabian and uh, Greek, a little bit of Greek in that, and also uh, the uh, Chaldean. 
So these languages was a mixture, and this is what they spoke in the New Testament in Palestine, which was called Aramaic. So whenever he cried that, they didn't know what he was saying. They said, somebody said, oh, he's calling for Eli. But Jesus was speaking pure Hebrew, and he was speaking it because in Psalms 22, 1, this is what was prophesied that he would say on the cross. And I'll show you that in a few moments. But Jesus was on the cross. He cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, uh, down in verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again, again, the second time now, with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. That is, he gave up the spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now, I just want to say this, that whenever these, were, these things happened and Jesus died on the cross, the centurion, the Roman centurion of the Roman army that was crucifying him, he looked at that and saw all of these things and he said, oh my God. He said, surely this was the son of God. But it's strange that the Hebrews who had tried him and said, crucify him, you know, we'll take Bravos, you crucify Jesus. And all the, the high priesthood and all of that, none of them seemed to pick up that this had to be of God. All this darkness that came over the earth and the shaking and the trembling and so forth. All these things happened, and the strange thing about it is that it was prophesied and spoken of over in the uh, Old Testament and was prophesied that it would happen whenever the Messiah would die in this fashion. I want you to go with me to Isaiah 53, for instance. Look at Isaiah 53. This is the way that you would have seen Calvary. He's, he's prophesying here now in 53. The way you would have seen Calvary, and if you were standing there looking at it, and if you were on the ground observing it, this is the way it would have been, it would have happened. It says here in 53.3, he is despised and rejected of men. I am uh, reading right here. Let me move that down. The sufferings of Christ are prophesied uh, in Isaiah here. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet he did esteem, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisements of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Jump into verse seven here, just save time. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. All of this is true. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and he was. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off, that means he was killed. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Verse 9, and I'm going to conclude here. And he made his grave with the wicked. That is, Joseph of Arimathea put him in his own tomb. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his, the rich in his death. I mean, it's Joseph of Arimathea. The wicked were those who died on the cross with him, especially the one who would not acknowledge that he was the Messiah. But one of them said, uh, you are the Messiah. And he said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. So one of them receive salvation by his acknowledgement of Christ, of Jesus being Christ. And the other one did not. This is what it's referring to, his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he was buried in rich man's tomb. And uh, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, this is a prophecy in Isaiah, the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, I'm going to also go to Psalms here for a moment. Psalms 22 is where it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's 22.1. This 22 Psalm is how Jesus felt on the cross. 
in, in Isaiah 53 is how it would be if we were standing there looking at him and seeing the whole picture. But when you go to Psalms, because it's written by David, and David uh, it was, it was a prophet as well as a king, but he was also to be the, the forefather of Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, who would be born, born of Mary. So anyhow, this goes on to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the words that he said whenever he was on the cross. Looking down at verse 6 here, just to save time, 22, 6 of Psalms. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men. He's talking about himself now. It's his feelings on the cross. And a reproach of men and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And this is all stated, you know, in like in Matthew 27, 43. I mean, you don't have to show it or anything, but this is what was done. They laughed at him, mocked him, scoffed him. And it's prophesied right here in Psalm 22 that all that would happen. And they laughed him to scorn and so forth. And he said he was the approach of men. And also, strangely enough, in Psalms 109, uh, in, in Psalms 109, 25, it prophesies that they would laugh at him, mock him, and scoff him in this fashion. And they would do that. So it's prophesied in Psalms 109 as well. Now, moving very quickly here, just to wrap all this up in Psalms, uh, that is about his crucifixion. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have in, enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. And this is Psalms now. The prophesying of the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones. Remember, it's all in first person. Jesus feeling that on the cross. Uh, they tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Verse 18, they part my garments among them, which they did do, and cast lots upon my vesture, which they did do, the Roman soldiers, as you well know. Now, I'm just pointing out to you here how that in two major places, and it's found also in other places in the Bible, talks about Jesus' crucifixion. And it talks about his sufferings on the cross. But the darkness, I'm going to go a little bit further here. But the darkness and the earthquake are prophesied in Psalm 18. Look in Psalms 18, if you would. I'm going to Psalm 18 here now to uh, talk about the darkness, this part of the crucifixion. Not his sufferings and not him doing it for the sins of the people, but the sufferings, I mean, the darkness that came upon the earth whenever he did this. Look at verse uh, four. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Verse six, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even unto his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Jump into verse 9. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. <clears throat> this is speaking about God Almighty as, as the Spirit and Jesus Christ. Now, God did not die on the cross. The man Christ Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus was on earth, he was both God and man. You well know that. He was both God and man. And it was the man Christ Jesus that died on the cross. But the spirit, praise the Lord, God, the mightiest spirit, cannot die. It is forever. It is eternal and so forth. <clears throat> but the man Christ Jesus died. And, and the man Christ Jesus in his death prayed unto the spirit just like he did in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the Calvary. Now... I'm going to move on a little bit further here because it speaks here about the darkness covering the earth. And I want to go to number two here. This is interesting because we're going back to Matthew 27 and verse five, 50 here. Matthew, going back to Matthew 27. Uh, and this is where it all happened. Now we read verses 45 and 46 where he cried, Eli, Lama, Sabbath, can I... Why, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Going to verse 50 now, look at this closely. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. This is where he died. And behold, the veil in the temple was rent in twain. Now take hold of this because this is going to be 
the basis of our lesson here tonight, the beyond the veil, the veil in the temple was rent in twain, in twain into uh, from top to bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Notice it went from top to bottom, so that you know that God ripped the veil. It wasn't like pulling the men on the bottom, pulling it up to the top. This was done in the temple of Herod's temple. It rent the veil that goes into the holy place of the temple of God that was on the temple mount. All of that happened when Jesus died. Both the veil that was going into the temple and the veil that went into the holy of holies was rent in two. And those things happened. And I'm going to talk to you here about it. So I'm going to go here right now to uh, what is behind the veil. What's behind the veil. And I want you to go with me here to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to talk about the veil being rent in two now. I'm going to the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews speaks about many things that Jesus Christ tried to bring to the Hebrew people. Now, it does, we do not know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but most Bible scholars believe it was Paul. Even though it doesn't start out like Paul always started out his epistles. It doesn't start out that way. But when you see the end of it, the way it wraps up is the way Paul always wrapped up his epistles. Also, Paul understood the law. He understood everything about the Old Testament. And he compares things to help the Hebrew people to understand that Jesus Christ fulfilled everything under the law. And he fulfills it in himself. And he wants us to walk through that veil and go into the presence of God and to have what God has for us. And this is what this whole uh, Hebrews book is all about. One step after another, he makes Paul, he makes Jesus, or he doesn't make him, he brings out that Jesus was this and Jesus was that and Jesus was this. All the elements of the Old Testament Jesus fulfilled them. And, and Paul in his writings in Hebrews points all of that out. I'm going here to chapter uh, 9. And uh, I want you to look at this. Chapter 9 and verses 2 through 8. Look at this very closely with me here. And follow me now closely. I'm getting into my real subject here at this time. For there was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the, ta uh, the, uh, the veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now, before I go any further, let me give you a picture here of what the tabernacle uh, may have looked like. This is an artist's drawings, and this is taken out of a, out of a particular book that I use, we'll come back to our chart here later, but I want you to look at this. This is a picture of the tabernacle, how it possibly could have looked. And if you were to have gone through the gate here, this was, this was, uh, this was 90 feet long, 30 feet gate, 30 feet on each side, 30, 30, and it's 90 all together. When you walked inside, this was a uh, it was a burnt offering. This is where all the sacrifices was made. Before there was a temple, it was only a tabernacle. The tabernacle wasn't that big. It was a little tent, actually, in the wilderness. This is a picture of it by the artist's drawing of it. This is his drawing of it. But in the front of that church or that tabernacle was the altar and where was all the sacrifices. Now, people, this gate was opened. In the morning, the priest would come in. People would bring their animals there to be offered for sacrifice, for repentance, for offerings of thanksgiving, for various reasons. They would bring their sacrifice to the Lord. and They would be offered here on, the, on this altar here. Beyond that was a, a veil of water. And in this water veil here was water that was put there. And the purpose for that was for the priest who would go into the tabernacle, they would wash themselves first. They'd wash themselves, and then they would go into this tabernacle where the presence of the Lord was. 
And I'm pointing this all out because they all did that. It was a very physical thing. They did it. They did it for for thousands, for a couple thousand years there in that Old Testament from the time of Moses. Uh, 1,500 years, I think, altogether is what it boils down to be. But they did this and followed that. And then later on, it was, it was developed, of course, into the temple. Now, here is another chart. It's by a different artist, but it shows you the overall picture of how it may have looked. This is the tabernacle. Here is the entrance to the gate. Uh, these are the people inside. This is the, the altar of sacrifice. The labor of water is right here. You can't hardly see it. It's very dark there. I'm sorry that you can't see it any brighter than that. But here was the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, there was the candle of, of there's a, of the seven candlesticks right here. There was a table of gold here. This was made out of pure gold. Everything inside under this covering, this is covered cut away as you can tell. Everything inside was of gold. This out here was all brass. Everything out here brass. These posts were all brass. But inside of this tabernacle here, everything was gold. And this, uh, this tabernacle here was 45 feet long. It was 30 feet from this veil back to this entrance of this veil. And then beyond this veil, there was a, another room that was called the Holy of Holies or the holiest of all, <clears throat> excuse me. And it was where the Ark of the Covenant was made of gold. The Ark of the Covenant was what they always carried by the priest. In that Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments that was written on stone given unto oh, Moses by God. <clears throat> that was also Aaron's rod that budded. And there's also a pot of manna, a golden pot of manna <clears throat> that had been preserved and God kept that. It was put inside and it staves in it. And it left there. Then there was golden uh, angels formed, put over, cherubim angels put over top of that. And every, once a year, a high priest would go through here and he would touch all of these pieces of furniture. He'd take it off this altar. It was a goat that he called sacrifice on the day of atonement touch all of these, go inside, touch all of these, and go inside and sprinkle it on this mercy seat, golden mercy seat, like this table here. Sprinkle it all over. Then he would come out. He would come out of that place, and that Shekinah glory of God from up in heaven would come down and consume the blood off of that mercy seat. And God, they would, people would know that God had accepted their sacrifice for sins for one year. For one year. <clears throat> now, this is what they had. It was a very powerful thing that they experienced. And uh, those uh, inside. Now, these things had representations. This altar represented repentance when we come to God. It's an altar where we die out to sin. This brazen altar, altar this water here, rather, represents uh, the labor of water. The labor of water where it represents baptism. Repentance, baptism, and we enter into the church of God, into the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there is the light, which is the spirit. And then there's a table of showbread, which represents the word. The word is the bread. The bread represents the word. This represents light and the spirit that gives light to understand the word. We have to have the spirit of God to rightly and properly comprehend and understand the word of God. Everybody hear me? That's very important. People that don't have the spirit of God and they try to try to decipher how, what the word means, they get into all kinds of situations. But the spirit of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, will lead and guide us into all truth so that it would help us to understand the word of God and it's designed for that. Then there was this veil. Just in front of this veil, I didn't mention it, was a third piece of furniture. It's called the altar of incense. The priests, when they would come into this, this room here, they would set this bread every morning. They would put the, the, the candlestick out in the morning and light it again at night so it would burn all night. And then they would take the, and then the next day they'd come back and replace the bread. Twelve loaves of bread, each loaf represents twelve tribes of Israel. And they would put there and was changed daily. And this veil that hung here in front of it was an altar of incense. This represented repentance coming to the Lord 
being baptized in his name. This altar here represented consecration. In other words, folks, when we get saved, it's not enough just to say, okay, I'm saved, I'm in the church now. But we have to consecrate our lives. This is the altar that we go to when we seek God for a deeper walk in the Lord. When we want to get closer to him. When we want to draw nigh unto the Lord. This is what all of this is all about here. Let's go through the veil. Because when the veil was rent in two, at, and Jesus died on the cross and the veil was rent, that means we have access to all of that. We have access to God's spirit. We have access to God's presence. We have access to a consecrated life before God. We have access, praise the Lord, to his very presence. Amen. And the Shekinah glory that would come once a year we can feel that come upon us in our worship services as we come together in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I'm showing you here how that this tabernacle plan as it was given, praise the Lord, uh, by, you know, by men who are artists that make it up today for us, helps us to understand how it may have looked then. This is another artist's drawing of how Herod's temple may have looked. Herod's temple, like here of course is the, this is the, this is the uh, court of the Gentile, this is the court of the women, this is the court of the men, and then, uh, court, and then there's a court of uh, the priest could go beyond here into the, into the temple. Now that was the way it was designed. So uh, Gentiles could come this close and they could worship from a distance. Women, Je uh, Jewish women could come even closer. And then the men could come inside and bring their sacrifices and so forth. Now, I'm going to go a little bit, they could, the women could come to the altar and that was as far as they go. Let me go a little bit further here though. I want to talk to you here about this temple here. This temple here, this doesn't have a cutaway here, but this is the way Herod's temple possibly could have looked. We know that possibly by Josephus' writings and, and what he had to say about it. So I want you to notice here how big it is. Solomon built Solomon's temple in about 1000 BC. It was destroyed in 588 BC destroyed, burned to the ground by the, by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt by Zerubbabel, who was another forerunner of Jesus Christ, a descendant of David. He was 14 generations before the coming of Christ. But Zerubbabel came back from Babylon, rebuilt the temple uh, in, in Jerusalem, and it was, uh, wasn't that spectacular. And uh, along the years, as the years went by, they kept refurbishing and refurbishing and rebuilding it. And Herod put a lot into that refurbishing that temple because he wanted the favor of the Jewish people. Herod the Great, as you know, who tried to kill Jesus when he was born, that Herod, uh, he was half Edomite. He was not all Jew. And the Jews, did, they sort of rejected him. So he tried hard to please them and make them all happy. And uh, one of them was that he refurbished that temple, made it very elaborate. This is why when Jesus in the 24th chapter of Matthew, when Jesus and his disciples were walking out and they're going over on the, out of the temple mount into the, across the Kidron Valley over on to the, uh, the Mount of Olives. They said, look how beautiful the temple is. See, they were telling him how beautiful the temple was. Jesus said, not one stone shall be left upon another. And this temple absolutely was destroyed just 40 years later after Jesus had said that. 40 years later, it was destroyed by the Romans when they came in. And it also destroyed Jerusalem as well again. Now, I'm pointing this out to say here, to get back to our subject here. The Lord wants us to walk through the veil. And I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm going to move these pictures off here because we pretty well understand here that you've got to go past the veil. And uh, the Jewish people symbolically would not go past the veil. They still hung to that Old Testament law. And we cannot do any more, have any more than what Moses gave us. But Paul in writing in the book of Hebrews tried to tell them, and in doing so tells us, that we can walk now past the veil because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent in two. Not from the bottom up like some man could have pulled, pulled it apart. But, and it's the temple, remember that. It's a high, a high place. It had to be from the top to the bottom. It had to be of God. And so the, the veil was rent from top to bottom 
and everything. It gave us access into the holy place so that we have access to the presence of God and the spirit of the Lord and the light of God. And also we have access, therefore, to the word of God by the light giving us that light in the word so that we can understand it. And then in going into the Holy of Holies, we have access then to the presence of God. Now, I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2, because we're in Hebrews here. There is a statement that I'm going to talk to you about here a little bit. And it says, let us, let us. And all through the book of Hebrews, Paul in writing, and I'm going to use Paul's name because I believe he was the, 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 the author of the book. Paul in writing to the Hebrew people was saying, okay, since this has happened, this happened, now let us now go further. We have that opportunity. We have that privilege. We have that right to go further into God, to know God, to have God, to have the blessings of God, the benefits of God, and all these kind of things and what God would have us to be and what he would have us to do. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to start here with Hebrews 9. He says, for there, for there was a tabernacle made, well, we just talked about it, the first wherein was the candlesticks, the second the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and we showed you that. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, whereon was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. We told, told you about that, that was inside of that ark of the covenant. It was a very precious piece of furniture. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. They were on each side and they bent over and their wings and so forth. And I won't go into detail about that. Over at the cherubims of glory showing, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. And when he says this, he means that the Ark of the Covenant was now, now not among them because they don't know what happened to it. This is where they made movies about it, that Indiana Jones stuff, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, certain all that. That's because that nobody knows what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. When the Babylonians took all that stuff away, they, and they destroyed the temple. Did they bring it back? Was it brought back? Was it not brought back? If it was, what happened to it? Did the Jewish people hide it someplace? A lot of them think they hid it down in those caves and caverns down under the temple or down in some cave someplace. You know that. They've gone down in the Dead Sea. They've gone in those caves and they've looked for that stuff and there's movies been made about all that. But I'm just trying to tell you here, folks, that it's because of this Ark of the Covenant was the most valuable piece of furniture that, the, that Israel, the Jewish people had with them. I can show you a scripture over in the book of Revelation where it talks about there was the, the, uh, the temple of God in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant was there. So I don't know if that was speaking of the real that or whether it was a type of or, another, or a vision that John had. I don't know. But anyhow, it does mention it there. Let me get to my point here. This is what he says here. Uh, which we cannot particularly have. Now look at verse 6. Everybody still with me? Yes, now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accompanying the service of God. In other words, they went in and they would do what they had to do inside. They sprinkle incense on the altar of incense. They'd light the candles. They'd put the showbread. All these kind of things they would do. But into the second went the high priest alone. He went only by himself once a year. Uh, he went alone once every year, the Day of Atonement. Not without blood. He took blood with him, the, the blood of the sacrifice that was made outside on that brazen altar. Which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. In other words, you couldn't go there before. Not just with the priest going once a year. That was it. And then the priest came out and the Shekinah glory came out. And the people felt forgiveness of the Lord. And they felt okay. And the next year they did it all over again. Because it had to be done once a year. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now look at verse 9. Which was a figure of 
of the, of the time then present. Now, let me just say this here. The Bible tells us here that we come to the place where that we have to sort of move on. Let's go behind the veil. Let's go beyond the veil. The veil has been opened up, and so we have to walk through it. Now, I'm going to have you go to a scripture in the Revelations here for a moment. I want to show you something. Just using this sort of out of setting here to give you a, where I'm going with this. Look at Revelations 3, 7. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, this was the perfect church of all the seven. It had no flaws in it. It never reports any flaws here. And to the angel of the church of, of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Notice that phrase. And that's what I'm pointing out here. I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now, I want to talk to you here about a phrase. And uh, we're looking here at this part of the scriptures here. Let us go beyond the veil, looking unto Jesus our Lord. Revelation. Now, look at C here. Entering into his presence. We just got through with, uh, with Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse 10, chapter 10, verse 1 here for a moment. Now this is talking about that tabernacle and the temple that was in the Old Testament up to the days of Christ. Verse 10, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, that is animal sacrifices, which they offer year by year, continually make the comers thereof perfect. Those sacrifices couldn't make you perfect. Verse four, jump down to verse four in chapter 10. For it is not possible that the blood of goats, of bulls and goats should take away sin. So the Lord is letting us know here that it's impossible for all these things to help us or to do anything for us. Now, going over to the 19th verse, I'm going to verse 19, Hebrews 19, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's 19, uh, Hebrew, I'm sorry, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 19, everybody with me? All right, verse 19, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Everybody understand where we are here. The veil has been rent in two and we have now, we have the right to enter in. And the writer of Hebrews here is saying now having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of animals and goats and things, but by Jesus's blood when he shed it on Calvary and the veil was rent. Verse 20, by a new and living way, <clears throat> which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. So his flesh being rent, you know, like he, at the last supper, he said, broke the bread and said, eat this is my body that's broken for you. His body was broken on Calvary, rent. The veil was rent. It's a type of his flesh. Now, look what happens. Look at verse 22. And having an high priest over the house of God, Jesus was also likened unto the high priest by the writer of Hebrews in an earlier chapter. We won't get into that one. Now look at verse 22. Here's where I'm going. Let us draw near. Now here's what he's encouraging us. Let us now, because the veil is open to us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's baptism. Praise the Lord. And then he starts using this phrase, let us, let us. I want you to notice here how many times I say that. Let us, let us hold fast. He goes on to say in verse 23, I think it's verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You notice here what he's saying now, it's time for us to do something. 
God has provided for us. Now let's do it. You know, sometimes we can say, oh, the Lord paid it all on Calvary. I don't do anything. I come to church. I sit here. I listen to the preacher preach. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. You know, I don't do anything because it's all been done. No, no, no. The writer is saying, now we need to, we need to do some things. It's time for us to act upon the veil being rent. Calvary, praise the Lord. Jesus shedding his blood. His body broken for us. It's time for us to act upon it. So here's what he says here. Verse 23, he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. In other words, what God has given you, hold fast to it. Down in verse 22, he said, let us draw near. Verse 23, he says, let us hold fast professing our faith without wavering for he that is faithful is promised. Look at verse 24. Let us consider one another. Let us be concerned about each other. And that phrase, let us, is found in the book of Hebrews 13 times, which is an implication that God wants us to take an active role in our walk with God. In other words, start doing things, praise the Lord, because the Lord wants us to do it. I'm going to read a little further there, 24th verse. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Provoke means to admonish, to encourage, to sort of encourage him to do it. Live for God, serve the Lord, walk with the Lord and provoke them to good work. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Notice that. In other words, let's try to help each other to come to church. Let's try to be together more. And he's talking about consider one another here. And then he goes on to say in verse 25, I'm going to read that first part again. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. That's the day of the coming of the Lord. And that's what we're seeing today. So God wants us, praise the Lord, to push ahead, to push forward, thank God, and to help people come to the Lord and be saved. We want to help them to do the same. Let us hold fast. Let us consider one another, verse 24. And then in verse 4 here, uh, Hebrews, let's see, I didn't read the 23rd. Let me read the 23rd verse. All right, I read the 24th verse. Now, let me, let me have you go to Hebrews 12, 1. Look at this. Before I do, let me say this, that Hebrews chapter 11 is all about the Old Testament people living by faith, but never receiving the promise like we have received it. We have received the promise of this eternal life, the veil been rent and, over, over, and, turned, and, and opened up to us. We can have the presence of God. But he is saying here in this 37th, this, this 11th chapter, that these all walk by faith. There's a whole list of, of these people, and I won't go into all the detail, but the 11th chapter of Hebrews is one of, the most, one of the most outstanding chapters you'll ever read in the entire Bible. Now, I'm going to jump to 12 very quickly here, because when he gets through talking about all of these people in the Old Testament, all the way from... Abraham and even Enoch, right on, way on down, right on down to the, to the prophets. He says here in chapter 12 and verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses as those people are, let us, you see that? Let us, now it's time for us to do something. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Beset means things that war against you. Like for instance, if a city had a wall around it and an army, an enemy army came up and tried to capture a city, they would beset the city, surround it and try to bombard it and so forth. And he uses that word here. Let us lay aside every weight, every weight, the things that will hold us back, things that hold us down from living for God, for walking with God. Folks, praise the Lord, live for God, live for him. Don't hang on to old stuff. If you're smoking on the side, quit it. I don't think anybody here is. I don't know if anybody is. Live for God holy. Keep the word of God. Live in holiness. Holiness is, in, is valuable. 
The Bible teaches us to be holy. Be holy for, the Lord said, be holy for I am holy. He wants us to maintain holiness in our lives. There's all kinds of things that we should abide by. But lay aside every weight and the sin. <coughs> the sin. You know, don't look at pornography, guys. Don't, don't ever mess with that mess. This crowd, I know you're not. I guess I should be talking to, to another crowd, but not to because I know you guys don't. But I'm just trying to say here, these are things that should be laid aside. And the Bible tells us that, for he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that, that which does so easily beset us. It may be that every one of us can have a sin that besets us individually. And maybe it's speaking about that. And let us run, another let us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, then here he likens it unto the Olympics that they had where they would run races and so forth. And so let's run the race. And of course, uh, this is brought out pretty heavily in Ephesians 6, 13 about the race. And also as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 2, uh, 24 rather. Now, I'm just trying to point out these things to you here that the Lord is trying to instruct us <coughs> that he wants us to go further in him. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So... And then I'm going to jump over to chapter 13. Chapter 13. This is the one right here. Chapter 13. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate or outside the gate. Jesus was crucified outside the city. The city of Jerusalem, they, they took him outside the city on a road that led away from the city and crucified him out on the outside of the city on the north side. Wherefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Now, here's what he says in verse 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him. <coughs> Excuse me. Outside of the gate. Let us go with outside the camp, he says bearing his reproach. In other words, Jesus was under reproach when they took him outside the city. And they said, oh, we got to take him out of the city because this is, he's, a, he's a sinner and all that. And they took him outside the city. Not sick. city is too sacred for Jesus or some sinner to be crucified. Also, they take him outside the gate. And he's saying here, let us go outside. Now, everything may be fine and hunky-dory with us today. But folks, there may be come a time whenever people are all against you for being a Christian. In some countries, they are. Some countries, they are. And people have to bear that reproach. Praise the Lord. And so Paul is saying here, if that's the case, let's be willing to go outside the gate, outside of the encampment, outside of the world, outside of what's the norm, that I might love God, worship God, walk with God. Uh, my son's been in China. He's been your pastor. He has been in Bang, uh, Bangladesh. He's been in some of those countries where this be either possessed by communism or possessed by uh, sometime Mohammedism, very strictly. And the people have to do everything in secret. They have to do it in hiding, especially under communism. They got to do things in hiding. And uh, they, they, they will hide and they'll be in service and everything. So sometimes it's a case like that, but still I'm going to walk with God if I have to do that. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to believe in him with all my heart. Praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now it's not in your notes here, but I'm going to have you go to with me to finish this up, wrap it up. I want to have you go to Hebrews chapter four with me for a moment. He uses this word, let us here also, because the book of Hebrews in general was us going beyond what they had in the Old Testament to what God has for us today. Look at me, look at this very closely here as I go into this chapter four, verse one. Let us, four one, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, his rest. And he talks about how the Holy Ghost will give us rest in the soul. Now, I could spend a little time on this and I don't have the time to do it. But let me just say this today to all of us here, folks. Sometimes when you're vexed, 
you're perplexed, you're weary, you're tired, your world's upside down. Just draw close to God, get close to the Lord, talk to the Lord and rest in him. The Lord can give you a peace that'll come all over you. You can, you can walk into this church with all kinds of troubles. But you can come down to this altar or just be in the presence of God in the service and feel that peace of God come over you. I've experienced it, I know. It'll just come all over you. I don't know how it's going to all turn out, but God is with me and I feel peace about everything. As long as you're doing right and you're walking with God, but he says to them, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of us of entering to his rest, his rest. He wants us to rest in our souls. Praise the Lord. And all the way down, I don't have to, I can't read all this, uh, but he, all the way down through chapter four here, he talks about this rest that is in the Holy Ghost. We can have that. And he gets on down verse nine. I'm just going to read this and wrap it up here. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There's a rest in the Holy Ghost. Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Again, let us. Praise the Lord. And then finally, he goes on to say here, I'm going to read uh, 14 and 16 to us here. Uh, if you look at these verses here, verse 14, seeing then that we have passed into heaven, into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us Hold fast our profession. What you believe, folks, hold on to. Praise the Lord. This is what the Lord wants us to do for us to do. You understand here that let us is not saying, well, the Lord did it all, therefore nothing for me to do. No, no. These are things we do. We press forward. We hold on. We seek out his rest and so forth. So he goes on to say here, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 16 let us therefore, again, let us, that, that is for us to do, therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And uh, I'm going to read this verse in 13. I want to go back to Hebrews 13 for a moment here. There's one thing I want to finish off here with. And this is... Uh, <clears throat> where he talks about uh, worship here. He said, I have, this is 13. Wait, I'm in the wrong place, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll get there. I'm looking at uh, 1315. Look at this very quickly here with me. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And I want to wrap this up by saying, folks, above everything else, let's worship God. Let's praise the Lord. Don't let anybody take away your worship. Don't let anybody dampen it. Don't let anybody put any kind of damper on it and praise the Lord and thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Be thankful unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I don't have time to go to it, but if you were, if you're on the screen, if you go to second Timothy chapter three and verse one, look at these verses with me for a minute. Chapter Timothy, second Timothy chapter three in verse one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Keep going. Verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. That's our day like we're living today, in the last days. Disobedient to parents. Isn't that something? Unthankful. That's a characteristic of our day to day. Whatever you do, be thankful to the Lord. When you pray, just say, Jesus, I thank you. Thank him for your home. Thank you for, for your wife, if you're a man. Thank him for your husband, if you're a woman. Thank him for that. Thank him for your children. Thank him for each individual. Thank him for your grandchildren, if you've got grandchildren. Thank him for your job. Thank you for your car. Thank you for your clothes. Thank you for the shoes on your feet. 
Thank you for the health you're in. Thank you, praise the Lord. Just thank God. Just go on and on and say, God, I am thankful and thank God and praise and worship him, folks. And don't let the enemy ever take it out of your heart and soul. Let's go on. Let's go forth. Praise the Lord. Let's do it. Amen. And we'll do those things. God will bless us and he'll be with us and he will never forsake us. Let's stand together and give God the praise. Hallelujah. You're a good audience here. God love you. Appreciate you so much. Let's just worship God together. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence, your power, your spirit, your grace, your goodness, God. Thank you for your people. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for each other, Lord, that it helps us to live for you and to walk with you, Lord. Thank you for our building that we can come together and worship you in. Thank you for your presence whenever we come together, Lord. We thank you for all things and we glorify you. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And let's keep on going beyond the veil. Amen. Jesus, rent it open for us. And let's do it. God love you. Amen.